Broadcasting on the internet airwaves from the great state of Minnesota, my name is Sean and you're listening to The Sean Tabbitt Show. Today my special guest is Philip Comfort and we'll be talking about his new book, a Commentary on the Manuscripts and Texts of the New Testament, which is published by my good friends over at Kriegel Academic. Philip, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Well, I always like to start things off by giving the author a chance to introduce himself to the audience. We haven't talked before, so I think it'll be interesting for me as well. But please take a few moments, introduce yourself, and just help us to get a sense of your education background and the kind of work you do. Well, I have a doctorate in literary interpretation where I did a doctoral dissertation on the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. And I've taught college quite a bit at Wheaton College and then the Coastal Carolina University. And I work remotely for Tyndall House Publishers in Chicago. I worked with them there for 13 years and now I live in South Carolina. My field, three fields of writing have been the New Testament manuscripts themselves, and then how they have impacted English translations of the New Testament. We've had a number of discoveries in the last hundred years that have changed things quite a bit. And then also, Another field of writing I do is in poetry. I've had several books of poems published, but that's not our topic for today. So those are the three areas I've published in. New Testament manuscripts, New Testament translations, and poetry. And this book that I'm doing with Craigall has some very brand new up-to-date information. I think that's what I'll say for right now. All right. Well, thanks for helping us to get to know you a little bit better. That's always very helpful. As you said, you're you're rather prolific when it comes to writing books about New Testament manuscripts and and translations. As we talked about briefly before the interview, uh, I really like some of your previous work that relates to this new book. Would love to hear more about your writing journey with some of these earlier books and how that leads you into this commentary that we're talking about today? Well, the book that's called New Testament Text and Translation Commentary is exactly what it says it is. That is, it's how have the New Testament texts or manuscripts that we have today, how have they impacted our translations of the New Testament? Like, I think we know, or most people know, that the King James Version came out in 1611. It was based on manuscripts from the 12th to 14th century. And in recent days, translations that come out are based on manuscripts that are in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. So there's been a tremendous change in translation work uh, through the discoveries of the manuscripts in the last 200 years. So I wrote that book to tell people, you know, things like why does the story of the woman caught in adultery have a footnote on it or set off or whatever that it's not included in the earliest manuscripts or why the ending to the Gospel of Mark has five different endings to it and things like that. So it's to help people go from their translations that they're working with to understand the text behind them. And then with Broadman and Holman, I published Encountering the Manuscripts. And one of the big significant contributions that book makes is the dating, paleographic dating of the manuscripts themselves with full descriptions of how we come about giving a manuscript a date. It's through comparative paleography when we compare the handwriting 
of a manuscript to other existing manuscripts. And it has a lot of other features, but that's the newest feature. Then the book that I'm doing with Craigall boils all of that down into a commentary about the manuscripts themselves and on the text of the New Testament without specifically referencing uh, any New Testament translation per se. And the new feature that's in that book that's in no other book is that I describe the Namana Sakra to the reader. That is the divine names, how different scribes use them or didn't use them to indicate specific names of God, like the Father, Son, Spirit, Christ, Lord, Jesus, God. All of those are written in a very special way in early New Testament manuscripts. And there's no other book that really describes this to people that I know of. So the one that I'm doing with Craig offers a full explanation of all of this. As you were working on this project, was there an ideal reader or group of readers that you kept in the back of your mind as you were putting this together? Oh, yes, definitely. It would be my Wheaton College students or my Coastal Carolina University students. I think of people who were studying the New Testament seriously and don't have knowledge of Greek. And so I make a point of it in all my books to talk to an audience. Of course, I know the Greek and I explain it to them, but I make it a point to not assume that my reader understands Greek. I take Bruce Metzger's textual commentary on the New Testament, which is an excellent book, but he assumes his audience are educated in Greek, but that is not the case with my book. You mentioned earlier that really in the last 200 years, we've just seen a ton of new manuscripts and really through the work of organizations like Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts and others, we're getting new manuscripts discovered and and digitized and cataloged. So we're seeing more and more pop up on our radar each year. I would love to get some commentary from you on how many manuscripts and fragments are, are known today and how has knowledge of and really easy access to, especially with high resolution photos being digitized, how has uh, that really changed as these things have been exploded, so to speak, and are now more widely available? I think the big discovery started in the 1850s of Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus with the works of Tischendorf and Tregellis. And then Grenfell and Hunt went to Egypt in the early 1900s, and they discovered hundreds of manuscripts there. The discoveries have continued. The Chester Beatty papyrus in the 1930s, the Bodmer papyrus in the 1950s, and Oxyrhynchus manuscripts coming out of Oxford. They're still publishing their findings from back in the early 1900s. They had so many thousands of manuscripts. So today, there's about 6,000 New Testament manuscripts. Of course, they don't all contain the whole New Testament, but we have about 50 manuscripts that are second and third century. We have another 100 that would be fourth century, another 100 that would be fifth century, and it goes on from there. And some of these, like Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, are pretty well complete. Almost the whole New Testament is there. I've seen and studied in person manuscripts in uh, Paris and Geneva, Switzerland and Oxford, England and Ann Arbor, Michigan at the University of Michigan Library and I value very highly seeing them uh, personally, but now 
uh, since they've all been photographed and digitized, you know, you have, anybody who knows Greek has access to them via the computer. And very interestingly, the most recent discovery is a papyrus of the Gospel of Mark that dates about A.D. 80, which is the earliest copy of any New Testament fragment, and it was the wrappings on the face of a mummy. So they found several mummies, and they actually have found three manuscripts of the New Testament that have come off of mummies. Just this past year this has happened. So manuscripts are being discovered all the time. Now, in relation to ancient manuscripts, you mentioned what you might call autographs in the book. And for the benefit of uh, some of the listeners who maybe aren't familiar with that term, explain what the autographs are and talk to us about the importance of, as best we can, reconstructing the original text of the New Testament. Well, the autographs are the original writings that were penned by John, penned by Luke, and penned by Paul or one of his secretaries. Paul typically would dictate his epistle to somebody like the man named Tertius in the book of Romans. He signs off in the last chapter. He says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, send my greetings to you. Tertius wasn't the author. He was the writer who penned it for Paul. Or like at the end of Galatians, Paul says, you see with what large handwriting I am writing to you right now. And he writes out the end of the book of Galatians. So if we ever found the autographs, the first thing is they'd be in first century Greek handwriting. And the experts would be able to tell that. They could look at it and say, yeah, this is first century. And also we would see, like in Paul's epistles, we'd see two different handwriting styles, that of the secretary and that of Paul. But as far as we know today, none of those exist. So it's the job of what's called textual critics to sort through all these manuscripts and come up with the most likely reading for any given verse of the New Testament. And and since this process has been going on for well over 500 years, it just gets more fine-tuned year by year. And I would say we've got it probably 95 to 97%. We could say with confidence that what we have now in modern Greek editions of the New Testament is a reproduction of the original. Now, there's some doubt about certain verses. One that I can think of would be John 134. Some early manuscripts said, and this is the Son of God, Huias Tutheu, and other early manuscripts say, and this is the chosen one of God, a collectos to say you. And it's split right down the middle, and the early manuscripts even, which one did John write in chapter 1, verse 34? We don't know, but responsible translations will choose one of them and then give a footnote that says, Other manuscripts read chosen one of God or other manuscripts read son of God. And so there's still some question as to the original wording, but not much. I mean, the New Testament, compared to any other work of literature, has so many more manuscripts. It's unbelievable the text critics can pretty well agree on the reconstruction of the original. So that's where we stand today. Now, one of the significant features of this new commentary is that you're offering commentary on actual manuscripts. Talk to us about how 
this differs in an important way from, say, other commentaries that are focusing on, say, a single version of the Greek New Testament? Right. My main focus for the last 25 years of study has been on the New Testament papyrus manuscripts, and those are the earliest ones. And so I will offer comments like in John 3, 6, it says, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. I'll offer commentary that in Papyrus 66, P66, the scribe wrote, that which is born of the Spirit, and he wrote it as a nomina sacra, pi, nu, alpha, with a crossbar over it, is spirit, and then he wrote out in full the word pneuma, pi, nu, epsilon, upsilon, mu, alpha, pneuma. So he was saying that what is born of the divine spirit is the human spirit. He differentiated the two. No other commentary does this. No other commentary actually describes what scribes we're actually doing in certain verses that are very interesting. Like, for example, in First Peter, one of the scribes says, and Sarah called her Lord. Now, usually, Lord would be written as a nomina sacra. It would be written Kappa Sigma with a crossbar over it. But in this case, the scribe realized that she was not calling him Lord God, she was calling him Lord like Master or one who's above me. So the scribe chose to write out the word Kyrios instead of making it a nomina sacra. That's the scribe of P72. So what I do is, in actual verses, I let the reader know what the scribe we're actually doing, and this doesn't appear in any other kind of book. And you've alluded to it and mentioned it with the uh, response that you just gave, but you do devote a significant amount of time to talking about the sacred names in this commentary. Why is this important? What are, are there key insights that we get into maybe thought of that time or mind of the scribe when we're looking at those? Yeah, now, there's a debate on when did the Namana Sacra get invented. It could have very well been with the original writers, or at least the earliest copyists, but the phenomenon is that everybody did it, no matter who who they were. Professional scribes, documentary scribes, people who hardly knew Greek uh, scribes, everybody made the divine titles, wrote them in a special way. They abbreviated them and then put a crossbar over them. So if you look at a manuscript page, you would see Kappa Sigma with a crossbar. That's Lord for Kurios. Or you'd see Yoda Sigma with a crossbar, and that would be Jesus. Since people don't read manuscripts, they read Greek New Testaments, these are never shown in Greek New Testament. So they're only seen if you get out an actual manuscript. So I felt it was important to tell readers how the scribes were using these to emphasize the divine names. Now, the five names that they emphasized were Lord, Jesus, Christ, God, and Spirit. And then, later on, they started adding Father and Son. And then then they also wrote the names for cross, staros, in a special way, with a crossbar over it. And they would then, later on, start writing other names as, as special, like Savior. These were written in a way so that when the reader of the manuscript read it in church and he would come to the divine name, 
he would give special emphasis to it. He would say, and the Lord, or in Kurios, said, and then what follows. So my whole goal in all of my writing is to bring to the English reader what readers of the actual manuscripts see. Thinking of the intended audience, if we're saying student at Bible college or a student at grad school, but really anybody who's interested in digging deep with the New Testament, I think is going to get use out of this. But focusing back on the student, give us a little walkthrough. If I was a student, how might I best make use of this commentary in my daily study? Well, I would just open it up to where Matthew begins. And if you're studying Matthew, put this by your side there, and you would see right away in Matthew chapter 1 1, um, it says, And this is the genealogy of Jesus the son of Abraham, the son of David. And very interestingly, in Papyrus 1, that has Matthew chapter 1, uh, I point out that son of David is a divine title. It's not just that he's called an heir of David, but son of David is a messianic title. It's the title of one who is the Messiah. People would call out, Son of David, have mercy on me. So it's the same as saying, Messiah, have mercy on me. So you wouldn't see that in any study Bible. You wouldn't see that in any commentary on Matthew. Uh, You'd only see it in my book. My book would tell you that in chapter 1, verse 1, our earliest scribe, the guy who did Papyrus 1, wrote Son of David as a divine title. So as you're reading along, you can look at the book, and I'll point out some of these very interesting and significant things. Well, I think another interesting feature, if I remember right from the catalog pages I saw for this book, trim size, it's going to be similar in size to, say, the traditional NA28 or or UBS volumes of the Greek New Testament? Yes, it is, right. So it'll, it'll fit, fit nicely in your book bag or look really great up yeah. on your shelf. <laughs> right. Yeah, both ways. As you think of you know, professors, students, and, and others who are going to be engaging with this commentary, for you, you know, what does success look like when they're using it? How do you hope that their work and study is impacted by this commentary? Well, I, I hope that they have an understanding and appreciation of the process that textual criticism and Bible translation has gone through. Most people, as I said, don't sit down with actual manuscripts. It takes a lot of work to read a Greek manuscript. There's no space between the words. There's hardly any punctuation. There's a little. And there's the interesting feature of the Namana Sacra. At best, most people open up a Greek New Testament and read that, and that doesn't reflect nomina sacra, doesn't reflect ancient punctuation or anything. And so I'm going back one level before the Greek editions to the manuscripts that are used for the Greek editions. So... I hope that people have an appreciation of the manuscripts. And if you know Greek, I hope you go look at the manuscript itself. And uh, like if anybody lives, you live real close to Ann Arbor, you can go to the University of Michigan Library and study Papyrus 46 that has Paul's epistles as dated early 2nd century. It's an awesome manuscript and people, I hope, would be inspired enough to want to go see it and take a look at it. So that's my goal. Obviously, being able to see these manuscripts up close and in person is just a great experience, especially if you love Greek or, in the case of the Old Testament, love Hebrew. It's just so much fun to see those things up close and personal. But also, too, with different Bible software packages available today, whether that's Accordance, BibleWorks, Logos, whatever you're using, most of those have 
either in a base package or you can get it as an add-on, digitized versions of so many of these manuscripts that are mentioned in the commentary where you can zoom in on a high-resolution photograph right on your computer screen. You don't even have to leave your home. Yeah, that's really awesome what has been done and what is continuing to be done. And manuscripts keep coming out all the time because, like I said, in Oxford at the Ashmolean Museum, they've only gone through not even quite half of the manuscripts they found in the early 1900s. They have thousands and thousands of more fragments to go through, and they keep publishing new fragments of the New Testament all the time. Four or five years ago, five or six new ones came out. Another one was Revelation, one was Acts, one was the Gospel of John, uh, one was First Corinthians. So, yeah, they keep coming out, and we keep getting these new discoveries. For the listeners who are interested in manuscripts and in translation and related topics, what are some must-have resources that they might want to have for their personal libraries? Obviously, I'm going to say your two books that we mentioned earlier in the call would be high on my list. I've appreciated both of those, and they have a prominent place in my library. In addition to those books, what other books might you recommend for somebody who's starting out or wanting to build a library around this subject? Well, another book that I did with David Barrett is called The Text of the Earliest New Testament Greek Manuscripts. It's simply what it says it is. It's the actual text of Papyrus 1, Papyrus 2, Papyrus 4, all in one book. You can get that book. Now, virtually, oh, every biblical electronic publisher has copies of that, and they can get that and so they can access the manuscripts. You can get copies of Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus and the freer manuscripts. You can get those. And then I highly recommend any book by Bruce Metzger. He was my model, and uh, I was inspired by him. Anything that Bruce Metzger has written, his book called The Text of the New Testament, and his book, The Commentary on the Greek New Testament, tells readers how they came about their decisions when they made the United Bible Society of Greek New Testament. And uh, the Alans, they also published a book, Kurt and Barbara Alans, called The Text of the New Testament. It's very, very profitable. So I would recommend anything by Metzger or the Alans to add to the library. Yeah, and I would say, too, with... uh some of the works by Metzger, some of them are a bit pricey, uh, but they're worth it. <laughs> Skip yeah. a few cups of coffee so you can afford one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, I would imagine, you know, as you've studied through the years, you've probably engaged with a bit of Bible software. For you, when it comes to working with manuscripts and, and translation, do you have a, a personal favorite or software package that's been most profitable for you through the years? I'm kind of old-fashioned. I'm surrounded right here in my library with all kinds of books about manuscripts, and I just pick it off the shelf. I have photographs of all of the New Testament manuscripts. I've spent a lot of money. (laughs) I did it the old-fashioned way with books, so I I don't use a software package, but I know there's a lot of them out there. I'm sorry I'm not up to date. I'm not, I'm an old timer here. <laughs> That's okay. Sometimes sometimes it's nice to be old school. It it helps you to slow down and actually experience uh, experience things a little more as opposed to just trying to get an answer super fast. Yeah. Philip, if the listeners want to find out more about you, find out more about your books, is there any particular place on the web where they should go? If they go to Google or any engine search, uh, if they type in Amazon.com, and then get to Amazon.com, and then type in my name, Philip Comfort. All of my books will come up. 
that's the way they can know about me and know about what, what I've written. Well, and just to make it easy for our listeners today, what I'll go ahead and do in the show notes for this episode, and you'll be able to find those at seantabbitt.com, I'll put links directly to all of the specific books that we've mentioned by name during our talk today. And then I'll also put a link to Philip's author page on Amazon. So if you want to see the full range of books that he's worked on through the years, and there are quite a few of them, you can just click right through and see them all. Very good. Well, it's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks to all of our listeners today for being a part of my conversation with Philip Comfort, where we talk about a commentary on the manuscripts and text of the New Testament. For more on this book, you can go to the publisher's website, which you'll be able to find at kriegel.com. And as Philip mentioned, all of his books are available on Amazon.com and wherever good books are sold. Philip, just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Okay, thank you. And that's all for this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can connect with me via email using show at seantabbitt.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I go by the Twitter handle at stabbitt. And if you enjoy the show, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off. Hey!